So I'm Becky Gunter, the Gallery Coordinator, Education Manager here at the Sheldon Art Galleries. Um, this morning we welcome Jessica Thornton. So I'm going to read a short bio of Jessica. So Jessica Thornton earned a BFA in painting from the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts. She received a three-year residency at the Connecticut Commission on the Arts Urban Artist Initiative that led to a focus in nonprofit and community development via the arts. In 2008, Thornton earned an MFA from Washington University in St. Louis, and she is currently an assistant professor in painting and drawing at the University of Missouri School of Visual Arts in Columbia. So we welcome Jessica. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Our pleasure. I'm really glad you're here. This is nice because we can maybe, you don't have to talk at you, we can kind of just talk and be together. So um, I just first want to say thank you to Becky and Paula and Stephanie, everybody at the Sheldon for making this happen. Um, it's been a long time coming and we'll, I'm going to share a lot of information with you that is probably sometimes considered maybe oversharing, but in order to talk about the work, in order to get to the, 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 the part of the work, um, I have to kind of go there. So I just want to say thank you for providing this space and making me feel comfortable getting this together and spending the last year working with you and, and Paula has just been so fun. Um, even uh, they did um, came to the university and met with the grad students there that we teach. They gave some um, feedback and also saw their work. Um, and some of the grad students will be showing uh, here coming up sometime in the next few months or years. Um, so I'm just really grateful for this relationship. It's been fun, yeah. very fun. So thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it has been a very long time since I've given an artist talk. Um, a lot of things have happened. So again, this talk is going to be different than what I usually do in that it's a very personal situation. So um, thank you for listening and sharing your space and your time with me. Um, I'm going to try and slow it. Usually I tend to go quickly. People don't care. Just get through it. Get through it. Um, but there's a lot in this to, that I have to unpack. So I am always open to feedback or insights or if you have questions or concerns. Um, this is my website. If you, you can uh, get there and, and send different messages to the website if you, if you want to. Um, but this part of this work in the show right here is the I called insecure identities and this it stems from this wanting to as many people as they grow older and they, they go into the world they want to find their authentic self um, and they're not sure which sort of hat they're wearing which kind of mask they're wearing and I'm in my 40s and I'm still trying to figure this out right um, so this insecure identity thing is the want to fit in a specific place and I come to this work and I come to all my work um, from this biracial perspective where um, this I call it the constant other where you know in a group of white people I'm the darkest person in the group of black people I'm the lightest person and you sort of you live in this space or you, you understand this space of sort of never really being a part of the thing or never feeling like you're really part of the thing and this work is about that coming from all my work is about it is wanting to um, assess and sort of sit somewhere permanently and not being able to do that it's about the insecurity of that it's about the um, search for an identity or something truthful um, so that's it I'm going to try not to speak oh one more thing I'm going to say about that um, I'm trying to speak concretely about it, but it, that's hard. This, this, what I'm talking about is from 2000, the, the work and the ideas from 2006 till now. I came to St. Louis from Connecticut, um, and I came here to go to graduate school. And I came here too to, to understand how race was a part of my work. I had been asked that by a, um, somebody in the, from the paper. And it immediately brought tears to my eyes, and I started crying. Um, as a in the '90s, growing up in the '80s and '90s as a biracial person, um, 
Well, those things weren't talked about, right? You, you, you just everybody was polite, and we we got to do our best to get along, and you know, it was sort of swept under the rug. It wasn't like like it is today. I I don't believe. Um, when I got here, when I got to graduate school, I started um, I was looking at old family photos and um, started using them as a sort of resource, um, thinking about how I fit into this family. And these are my great grandparents, Isabel and Irving Tyler. Um, and I was just recalling first how soft my grandmother's hands used to be and how much I, I loved them. But um, also this just very young being aware of the fact that I've looked so different and you know wanting to believe that I fit in but also believing like well, what if they don't like me what if they're pretending you know do they really love me you know I'm not I'm different than them um, you know, and this sort of like feeling like, even as this kid that, that like wanting to hide myself but not being able to. I'm going to try not to get emotional, but it, it just naturally happens. So it's, it's, a, it's not a big deal to me, but so just you. So I, I I've used these photos and built this whole other, this series of work that was based on called The Other Zoo. You know, feeling like the other person, but also using these stereotypes and this playing with maybe some of the derogatory or negative um, feelings that people had about interracial people or people of color when mixing and, and this connection to animals. Um, a lot of my work has certain, like, sort of, um, is pointing at different artists, different artworks. This in the background is a George Stubbs painting that, um, of, whoops, of, of a zebra. Um, and it's just sort of a, a nod to him. And I remember being a child and, and really connecting with animals and things that were black and white, right, that were both. And, and the zebra was one of them, or zebra, we talked about so the other <laughs> pronunciation, the zebra, the zebra. Um, and so I've always been drawn to the zebra and felt like sort of um, like, a, like a little, uh, what is it called, animal, uh, your spirit animal, or, or something to connect with. Um, I was always looking for something to connect with. So, also with that, whoops, um, we're coming from the shoreline of Connecticut, the water, being out here in Missouri, all of a sudden I feel very landlocked. Um, so, so in my imagery, in my work, the ocean and land started to show up together. And so, so slowly, it, this, you'll see that the, the ocean sort of fades out and becomes more about land. So this portrait called Jungle Fever, again, another pretty derogatory, some people use it thankfully, some people use it in a fun way to talk about men maybe who have uh, an affinity for uh, women of color, right, or vice versa, right. Um, but also this, again, the animal that is black and white sort of um, really connecting with the capuchin monkey. Um, but thinking about Angela Davis, who was, you know, from the civil rights activist, leader, scholar, and Fred Rogers of the, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, who I adored as a child, just imagining what those two neighborhoods would be if they got together. Um, I was thinking about the Arnold Feeney, Feeney portrait by Jean Van Eyck, um, and I was like, you know, it was just a sort of what-if situation. What if this happened? What would this world be like? Um, so this is one of the first paintings when I was in grad school that I constructed that I really felt, okay, I'm on a, I'm on a trajectory, I'm on the path, this, is, this feels right. Um, it's kind of funny, it's light, um, but it's also, to me, these are people that I looked up to and I, and I think really sets out what it, being biracial, being a person of color in this world, sets up this two-sided of this dichotomy of very different realities that, that have to come together somehow, right? Um, so I worked with that, and, and again, I, I love this. this is one of my favorite paintings of all time. Um, and just, just thinking about, I was also considering women, black women, and marriage, and how um, it's, it's something that the black woman in the world doesn't, isn't really, doesn't have a lot of that, doesn't, isn't seen as having a lot of uh, marriage or t 
tight family structure. I mean, there's, a, there's traditionally been a history of unwedded black women. And so I was just sort of thinking about them playing with Angela Davis and Fred Rogers marrying and the world. Do you feel that that there. image of black women is through the white lens because, or through the narrative of society? Because I know a lot of black families where the mother's a matriarch, so yeah. I was just curious. About yeah. That. Yeah, I think she's the matriarch. The, the, there's also like the reality of her. The the father figure is taken. Yes. Yeah, it's always been taken from the family, right? So she is the matriarch, but she she's the, those standing alone. Right, I think I think does that? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is what I was thinking about is that she's often left. To, to carry and take care of the children. There's a lot of um, black men that are incarcerated, um, taken away from family in that way. And, and it's sort of, I was just thinking about the black woman and, and, and myself, just like, who do I marry? Who, right, yeah. who, who, which side do I go on? I mean, it doesn't come down to it, but the, the, a lot of this work is about naivete, like not having answers for anything, not knowing enough about my culture or, any of the of the language that's being spoken and being frustrated by that, right? Um, and wanting to be part of this black culture. That again, I was in the middle of Clinton, Connecticut, where it was majority white. I was one of three black students in my school, and I just didn't know how I fit into the world. So I think when I went to grad school, I was, I was only I was at 26 on packing this, you know, which is again I, I have to talk about the naivete because it's not knowing your own history and never being taught that. So um, it's a black woman say through. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so at grad school. I started playing with this idea of creating landscapes, otherworldly landscapes. So we got some plaster of Paris and dinosaurs, and I think that is, oh, is Disney, the Wicked Witch. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I think that's who that is. So I was setting up these like situations, these worlds. Uh, where they were just like fantastic and, and it was sort of magical realism-ish. Um, and it, it felt natural to me to create this space, this other space that was uncolonized, that was free of the civil rights movement or free of slavery. It was free of all of that, right? It was this other place and I kind of went there to sort of unpack this stuff that I didn't really know about, that I didn't want to wrestle with. I started adding random images, and the images became very, um, let's say, black. It's just black for another. They, they kept being black, and I was thinking about my schooling um, as a very traditional um, undergraduate experience, learning the figure, and never having a black body to draw. Never having, not never, but very rarely, um, and, and, and wanting to create this space where I was studying black bodies. So I was thinking about that and just trying to imagine this other world. Again, we're going back to the woman in marriage that, that plays a, a significant role in this early work. It's about um, people of color dressed in white you know, either being married or being servants, that sort of thing, going in between those two places. Um, but the, the surface of the canvas, I, I first just created, I was using colors that were in different skin tones. And just scraping the, the, the whole canvas was covered like this. And then out of that, that um, amalgam of um, shapes and colors, I would try and find these situations, whatever pop up, whatever I would see. And I wouldn't I would try not to second guess it. I would just make make the story afterwards, see what was present to me. But it's it's the other world series. So there it's the this is supposed to be Earth. Um, this is the, and, and scientifically located like location wise, I wasn't again the naivete, not trying to make it accurate, not trying to like I was thinking 
is that where the earth is? Would that be close? I didn't know these things. So I was trying to play with my ignorance um, and, and just kind of make these worlds, not think about them too much, but um, just think about what it means to be a person of color and a white majority. Um, but also knowing that I actually have it really good. I mean, I, I didn't have to grow up in the 60s and, you know, I grew up in the 90s and it was pretty um, tame, I guess. I didn't have to deal with what my father dealt with. So um, I thought, thought I was free to experiment, free to explore. Um, but again, it, it was about, these are larger paintings from that came this, um, which was, an attempt to take skin color and make it a thing, right? It's kind of like material that we were talking about before. Is like really focusing on this amalgam, this this multiple layered thing. That um, again, this this is eight by let's say eight by four, eight oh. feet by four feet. Um, and it's one of two paintings. This was my part of my thesis, and I was using this. I was trying to uh, mash the future, the past, the present, and the future together in one. So the space that they live in is in the future. The way they're dressed is in the past, um, and there's a sort of in between the space that they don't really exist in either, but they exist in all of them. Was my thinking my attempt. Um, and Double Dutch, you know, something that maybe is traditionally associated with young black females, right? Um, wanting, again, addressing this, I've never had a really good black female friend. And it's something I still get really upset about because um, I feel like I've lost a lot or I haven't gotten a part of myself because of that. Um, and I was thinking about wanting to grow up and be playing double dutch in a black community and you know there's just, just just thinking about that and thinking about what I didn't have and what I wanted. Um, so this is kind of a self-portrait um, and it's to be young, gifted, and black a song by Donny Hathaway um, was really poignant to me and I did feel growing up like I was not seen by the people who were supposed to be coaching me, hence the um, high school, um, what are they called, were they high school counselor, like, a, like it's telling me that, that, you know, school and college wasn't for me, and I mean, which I'm a professor now at the university, and, and I think back to that, and just, and that has happened many times in my life, just being dismissed, and who knows what the reason was, you know, but, but the skin color, the who I am, comes up at, at the front of it um, a lot of times. So that, that, to me, I feel like I was that kid that was kind of, you know, playing musical chairs and never getting a seat. Um, so that's a little bit what this is about, is, is sort of like paying homage to that, that little me. Um, but also using this, this very sort of European look to validate these imagery. Um, their skin tone has a little bit more ethnicity in it, and, and just bringing those two worlds together. Oops, it's a beautiful white screen. <laughs> The void of your thought. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. Um, so all that to say, then we come to, after I left grad school, I get a, a, a visiting position at the University of, of Missouri. From that, um, I spent the first few years just working nonstop and really doing the best out. My position turned into a tenure track position. They wanted me to stay. and and be part of it. So I, I really felt like I made it. I felt like I made it and I felt like I'd done my job and I, I was fitting into this Midwestern place that was very different from what I got out of up but in. Um, but it was, was working. And then I had a stroke. And I lost the ability to speak, walk, talk, everything. And as a painter, they said, you know, if you don't have your hand back in six months, you're not gonna be able to paint. Blah, blah, blah. So, 
everything just completely went the other direction. Um, and I was scared. And I ran across this video. Um, there's many things, but this is one of them that really gave me a direction or gave me strength in the direction. And we don't have to watch the whole thing, but I just want the beginning. Um, I shared this with my students a lot. This was a game changer for me after I, you know, thought my, my world was over. Um, so I'm just going to play the beginning, but... It was actually good for some things like mixing a can of paint or shaking a Polaroid. But at the time, this was really doomsday. This was, this was the destruction of my dream of becoming an artist. The shake developed out of really a single-minded pursuit of pointillism, just years of making tiny, tiny dots. And eventually, these dots went from being perfectly round to looking more like tadpoles because of the shake. So to compensate, I'd hold the pen tighter and this progressively made the shape worse, so I'd hold the pen tighter still. And this became a vicious cycle that ended up causing so much pain and joint issues, I had trouble holding anything. And after spending all my life wanting to do art, I left art school, and then I left art completely. But after a few years, I just couldn't stay away from art, and I decided to go to a neurologist about the shake and discovered I had permanent nerve damage. And he actually took one look at my squiggly line and said, well, why don't you just embrace the shake? So I did. I went home, I grabbed a pencil, and I just started letting my hand shake and shake. I was making all these scribble pictures. And even though it wasn't the kind of art that I was ultimately passionate about, it felt great. And more importantly, once I embraced the shake, I realized I could still make art. I just had to find a different approach to making the art that I wanted. Now, I still enjoyed the fragmentation of pointillism, seeing these little tiny dots come together to make this unified whole. So I began experimenting with other ways to fragment images where the shape wouldn't affect the work, like dipping my feet in paint and walking on a canvas. Or in a 3D structure consisting of two by fours, creating a 2D image by burning it with a blowtorch. I discovered that if I worked in a larger scale and with bigger materials, my hand really wouldn't hurt. And after having gone from a single approach to art, I ended up having an approach to creativity that completely changed my artistic horizons. This was the first time I'd encountered this idea that embracing the limitation could actually drive creativity. At the time, I was finishing up school and I was so excited to get a real job and finally afford new art supplies. I had this horrible little set of tools and. Yeah, I felt like I could do so much more with the supplies I thought an artist was supposed to have. I actually didn't even have a regular pair of scissors. I was using these metal shears until I stole a pair from the office that I worked at. So I got out of school, I got a job, I got a paycheck, I got myself to the art store, and I just went nuts buying supplies. And then when I got home, I sat down and I set myself to test it, really try to create something just completely outside of the box. But I sat there for hours and nothing came to mind. The same thing the next day, and then the next, quickly slipping into a creative slump. And I was in a dark place for a long time, unable to create. And it didn't make any sense, because I was finally able to support my art, and yet I was creatively blank. But as I searched around in the darkness, I realized I was actually paralyzed by all of the choices that I never had before. And it was then that I thought back to my jittery hands and embraced the shake. And I realized if I ever wanted my creativity back, I, I had to quit trying so hard to think outside of the box and get back into it. I wondered, could you become more creative then by looking for limitations? What if I could only create with a dollar's worth of supplies? At this point, I was spent... So that it goes, and this is a great um, video. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but basically, I just wanted to show it and then give homage to this 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 video, this artist. Um, it really gave me a clear view that that I could find a way out of this, you know, and I could leave painting. I'd find different materials. I could. What what is it that I needed to do? 
Um, and it became about something other than painting completely, which was about cutting. Um, and, whoops, okay. I was thinking about this, the act, whoops, okay, I think we're going to have to get out of there. Sorry about that. There we go, okay. So, I was thinking about, um, and this, this work took a long time, so it started back in 2013. I didn't finish until 2016, but um, it became about trying to, and I had started a little bit about this before I was, um, before I had a stroke, but it forced me to really investigate this thing that I started, which was um, cutting into things and inserting figures and realities into spaces. It was a similar sort of metaphor for what it felt like for me, a person of color, like I said, that was never always the whitest or the darkest in a room. I always had to find a way to fit myself into the space, um, to to act appropriately, or to make sure people liked me, or that I didn't offend somebody, and I didn't scare somebody, and I didn't, you know, I was black enough, but I was also white enough, and. Um, but all these, a lot of the, the real life stuff that we've been going through with regard to black men and or black people in general um, losing their life, from my perspective, um, because of acting the way they acted, the moving the way they moved. And I was sort of thinking about Trayvon Martin and it's, it's part of it is, is, is living and, and, and wearing and, and moving in a certain way outside of an entertainment field, right? Michael Jackson um, can move and, and do all these things on the stage and it's acceptable for you to be loud and, and, and big and expressive and whatever. Um, but if you are a black man in the world, be careful with how you move your body. Um, because it could be con considered um, <sighs> violent, dangerous, uh, a myriad of things. Um, so it was just sort of this, this space I was thinking, like, how we as black people sometimes are allowed to do certain things and when we're not allowed to do other things and how you get into trouble with that. So I started carving um, these, these bodies into these um, uh, pieces of paper with lots of detail on them, trying to hide the body in the, in the landscape. Um, and, and you can barely see it. You can see it a little bit better in person, but there, there are different uh, bodies of Michael Jackson doing different moves and expressing himself in different ways, um, and just sort of kind of trying to play with those two sides of that reality, what you're allowed to do and what is acceptable and what you can't. Like if you're on a football field, don't don't get too deep, don't dance too much because that's that's not that's not good either. Um, eh, so that's that's where it started. And it also just this really interest, real big interest in dealing with pattern, um, understanding uh, what pattern could do and how it could be uh, really expressive. Um, and, and also I'm still doing painting and working with acrylics, but I'm trying to also learn how to use my hands still. So, so these are um, really labored images that, that were hard to construct. And one of the good things that came out of it is this, is this show called The Other. Again, I talk about this space that being an other in. Um, but this, this cutting a situation where we're taking um, different things. I started looking at the civil rights movement and the images that would just come up in um, on the internet when you put simple words like civil rights movement. Again, that naivete, like just being very simple, very childlike in my search for information, um, and 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 being upset about the fact or feeling very privileged to be at the University of Washington or excuse me, WashU. Um, having done that, but now being at the University of Missouri, um, and, and thinking about how I didn't have to go through a lot of it, and how lucky I was, um, but really wanting to connect to that space. So, um, this is an image from that show, The Revolution is Televised, 
Um, and in the, these images, these figures come out of literal photographs from the civil rights movement and flippantly I've taken them and sort of try to reorganize them in spaces that were not so violent, that were not um, dangerous and, and scary and painful. Um, that's where those figures of those kids come from, is this image from the Brooklyn riots, I believe this is from. Um, the other half of the image comes from this side, the dog is removed, but the two figures on the left are um, those, those two um, fighting males right there. So this is the, the little children on the right hand side and then them. And sort of thinking of the division of the world being half white and half black. You know, being in shadow or being bright and shown. Um, but really just carving out these different spaces that, again, were uncolonized, didn't have any of that, that, that violence and that history and being able to reinvent it. And again, it's, I look back and it's very flippant, it's very um, void of, of a reality that, that, I, that kind of pains me. But, but it, was, it was also like freedom, like, like a, a freeing of, of learning about this thing that I couldn't be a part of, that I'm lucky that I didn't have to go through. Um, so anyway, I, you know, having really per big troubles with my hands, being able to cut after I had a stroke, the university was so helpful to me and the um, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Office. I was um, allowed to have a studio assistant and help in my classroom to do, because I was having really bad mobility issues, right, and I was determined that I was not going to be stuck there. I was going to get by. I was going to find a way to get it back. You know, immediately I was reading about neuroplasticity and um, my first experience in a hospital. I, I learned they asked me to, I couldn't tell time, and it scared the daylights out of me. I was chose trauma, with it, but I immediately realized that it came back very quickly. Like it, it all organized, and I was so I really understood that it, it's about doing it. It's about not not being afraid of it. Learn it again; it'll be fine. So that was great, and it, it set me on this, this sort of track of um, I'm gonna get back to being able to cut again and hold and write and do all that stuff. But I have the great opportunity to work with an artist who's actually upstairs. I noticed she's one of my friends, Krista Martinsek, who is a printmaker. She's amazing, and she helped me. Um, get a lot of these images done to the um, accuracy that they need to do to sort of fit inside the paper. So it became about taking these civil rights images and putting them into new lands, putting them into new spaces that I control, that I got to experience, but also make better um, from my perspective. Um, this is another image uh, taken from the civil rights movement where they had some sit-ins uh, in the, the swim-ins equivalent where they would in a pool of different hotels and this image comes from there's this man dumping bleach into a pool of people that are of color and just wanting to like re to reorganize that in a space of like what if it was gold or what if it was you know youth saving formula you know how could we just make it something um, beautiful and I just liked working with this this gold um, pen and gold leaf and just thinking about privilege instead of taking what if what if it was giving so um, and again, I keep saying this is flipping because I, I was doing this, but I was also really angry with myself. Like, it, you can't just take these images and do this to them. Like, it, it was a, a sort of conundrum, but I ended up doing that because I felt like it would get me further along. I, 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 but I still, still sort of question it. Um, Can I ask what the scale of these are? Yeah, the, this, this one is... Um, the scale really changed for you. Yes. Dramatically. Yeah, dramatically. Thank you for for focusing on. Yeah, because I was working really big, but but again, the balance and I couldn't balance anymore. I couldn't um, hold or carry things. I used to be really strong. I was really confident about my strength. Um, I was slow, but I was strong. 
and I could work all day and all night and make these images and builds always. I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't do any of it anymore. And it was, yeah, everything went smaller. Yeah. And no more big canvases. You know, I couldn't carry couldn't carry them or lift them, so we can't do them. So it became about paper. It was Mally, I had to roll it up. It was also space too. Like um, but but working this paper that's like skin, um, this material, this size. But I could also work a little bit larger without it being heavy. I could use mm, that's I the next it. stage yeah, that I go to is like some of these are get a little bigger. Um, so this is from the 16th Street Baptist um, bombing. One of these figures is John Lewis, who actually comes up in another painting. Um, but again, creating these lands that were gold to me was just it was just all about like like luxury and not even luxury, but just wealth and something worth something. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about the patterns that you referenced. Yeah, just. The, I mean, are they like from a certain era? No, no, they're they're actually they're just paper. There's nothing in the material that is linked to something historically specific, other than there are patterns that I got at a store. They're, oh, okay. It's, it's right. very simple. It's just okay. paper that um, was man-made. Because then it became about too about this um, material that I didn't have control over. It was about losing control and having somebody else's. Um, hand come into things, mm. you know. Um, so this again, an image from Chicago, the Chicago um, Beach riots, and I trying to spread gold through these wands in the water. I don't know. I was just laboring and trying to get something positive. I kept going back to that gold. Uh, but also, here's the water again. The water comes back in. The water crashing up against the land, and again, being in Missouri, being landlocked. Um, but but also looking for places where I could find water, um, and just wanting to work with water. So this is m to my favorite image that I think I've ever made. Um, and this begins again, this is that second self-portrait. Um, and the title, Self-Portrait with Good Hair as Judith with Bamboo Earrings, I think to me represents this, like, the kitchen sink idea of, like, all the identities. Give me all of it, or take on everything they can. Um, Judith is a reference to uh, Artemisia, Artemisia Jemblowski's Judith mm -hmm. Mazur, Head of Hull and Fairness. A lot of times in my paintings, like I said, maybe I like to put different artists, like a, like a nod to different um, people that I've got inspiration from. So you'll notice the hand on that figure down there. There's there's kind of a home of Hunter's head under there. Hmm. So I'm telling you all my secrets. These are just things too that I don't. Nobody really knows because I don't. <laughs> I never get an opportunity, not often, to share this much. So, um, but the bamboo earrings were, are very much um, a, a symbol of, to me, women, African identity in the 80s. That was something that was very, that I remember seeing, like different family members or people I saw, and sort of wanting to try that on. So, again, the, the identity of the face is never shown in my self portraits. Um, but I, I don't know if you've heard of the term in the black community, it's the idea of good hair. Uh, the hair that is, um, you know, you can comb, it's easy to deal with. So, you know, I grew up with everybody saying, oh, you got that good hair. Um, and being ashamed of it and sort of like not like, no, I don't, you know, not wanting to do that, but also um, taking ownership of that and, and the ownership of um, my privilege as a light skinned person of color. There is privilege in that as well. Um, but again, the white dress signifying uh, purity or something, something honest. But also like a, a wedding, you know, being being wed. There's this constant thought with me at that time, like, who do I marry? Like, do I marry black? Do I marry? You know, and not sort of understanding where to go. So that title is about like sort of all of those um, labels or or. Um, 
places that that I tried to connect to as a child and even still as an adult, I suppose. Uh, excuse me, the yeah. background, the background yeah. in that. Yeah. Is that water or is that mountains or is that soil? That's it's, it's mountains. But it mountain. but one of the things I try and do in a lot of my paintings is sort of blur the line between clouds, so, mountains, and water. Like that it's all sort of the same and going into each other. So there's a, a little bit of ambiguity. So sure which yeah, yeah. You're like you're not sure what you're gonna get, if it's hard or soft or there's an unsureness. Yeah, absolutely. But this is, is a larger piece. Yeah. How you go like that. Oh, so you're getting larger. So so now I'm starting to get larger and, and understanding that I can be large with paper. And, and still move it and, and shape it. I can still kind of do a little bit, but I still have an assistant, so I'm still, you know, sort of gearing up to do this. Um, so here we go into the, the, the next set of this, all right? After that show went up, um, I started really getting more of my abilities back and sort of wanting to experiment more with materials and I was doing um, paper marbling and I had an assistant, Caleb, who, who was helping me do these things. He would carry the water into the studio to put in the bath to make these, um, these, I'm trying to think, um, these marble baths or paper. Um, but he, it, was, it was really um, exciting to think about the fact that I didn't have to um, stay in one place. I didn't have to just be a painter. I could do more things. So it was like this inability to do this thing allowed me to force me to do a lot of other things. Just like that the video that we saw, sort of working beyond what you think you're capable of. Um, and at that time, I was also, my mom had done Ancestry.com and she wanted me to do it. And so she, I got it done. And this ethnicity estimate that they end up giving you shows that the majority of me is English. Uh, the next one is sort of German and then Nigerian. So all of a sudden I had this location of black ancestry that many people of color don't ever get the opportunity to know. So I was really excited to sort of take ownership of this Nigerian and, uh, identity. So this is a figure that's sort of coming out of uh, the, the rubble or, or something sort of like that. And she's wearing, uh, I don't even know how to say it actually, it's a Jili, 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 I've heard it a couple names, a uh, couple ways, the hat that, that she's wearing. And I painted it like I saw it. You know, I went back afterwards and looked at what it meant. And there's different meanings to the direction of the hat, the way it's pointing, that has to do with marriage. And apparently this direction is, this person is a, a married woman. So I, I, again, working with that, I w I'm really interested in playing with that ignorance and not knowing things and trying them on and trying to make sense of them without having the reality to work with, that makes any sense. Um, so I'm trying this on, I'm using marble paper that was made, not by me, um, but this man-made paper that, that is the skin tone. And in this image, it's not cut and put in, because here I'm working by myself again. I don't have assistance, and I'm still having a hard time cutting. So, um, still dealing with the issues of, of, of not being able to do exactly what I want, create the way I want, uh, but just going with it and understanding that it will become something else, hopefully. Um, so this is another painting. So here we are again, back to four by four feet, okay? And so this is the other sub-portrait as a zebra with orange Nigerian jelly. Like this sort of, <laughs> way too much layering of like trying to present yourself as somebody um, and holding these flags you know that that okay now I can maybe subscribe to something my whole life I've never wanted to affiliate with things because I never felt like fit in and I still don't 
Um, but it's this act of trying to fit in. Um, and again, I've always identified as a zebra or identified with the zebra. So here I'm sort of like, all right, I'll become the zebra. Um, and it was really fun. I, I, in this last series of paintings, I've gotten a lot of my stability and my uh, balance back, which is amazing. My hand is a lot more steady. Um, I, I grew with this body of work. It's a little bit all over the place. Um, I've been criticized a lot in terms of my work not being, um, feeling like a body of work because it does so many different things with so many different mediums that there doesn't seem to be enough continuity. Um, but I think that's the nature of being biracial. Like you, you just don't see fit into one thing, right? If you're constantly trying something else on and that's the way I know how to exist. So, um, the COVID experience that we, I was in, um, because of my injury and my situation, I'm high risk and I was in isolation for an entire year and I got very depressed, I got very anxious. And when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or, and John Lewis died, there was a part of me that was like, oh my God, we're doomed. It's all going down. Um, I really, I, you know, you're in a space in lockdown, and I, I got very, very emotional about it. So this is something that I normally don't do, um, but it was an attempt to sort of memorialize these two people that I, that I had a lot of respect for and was looking for something to just focus on um, in a positive way, I think. And to me, this was positive paying homage to these, these two great people. Um, but also playing with the zebra again, and and loving those stripes and and really sort of the imagery of that is associated with them. Just wanting to work with it um, again. I just love that that zebra is yelling yeah. or like tribal, right. yeah, right, or brain, whatever that word is, right. The zebra. The right. zebra. The zebra, zebra, whatever. <laughs> right, and it, like, there was, I felt so powerless in that space. That. that there was something very powerful about that. Well, it's you that's yelling. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and it's me that. that's like with them, that we can do this, and they're so with us, they're gonna send us help, and, and I'm not sure where you ladies politically lie, but <laughs> Trump was hard for me, and that situation was difficult, there was a lot going on. Um, so it was just asking them for help, you know, wanting them to come help me. Uh, that was really, it was a really fun, fun one to do. Um, so while I was, in 2017, I had the opportunity to work down at the Whitney Plantation Museum in Louisiana. And this is um, a church that sits in the back of that museum, such an amazing place. Um, and while I was there, I didn't know it. I was mystic. I diagnosed for years at the time um, as having vertigo, when in actuality I had hydrocephalus. And when I was down in Louisiana at this time, the, this, it was so hot. I knew things were wrong and I was trying to get somebody to listen to me. They kept telling me, this is your new normal. You're going to have to deal with this and just keep going. So I was just like, as women do, we keep going. We just gotta get it done. Uh, this is how I am, I gotta figure it out. I was frying my brain and I was slowly dying, like very literally collapsing, having these spells. Um, so driving back and forth to Louisiana, I don't know how I made it, but I got back and um, had to have brain surgery. Uh, there was med this big ordeal. I spent weeks in a hospital. They, I had to beg for help. No one would get the neurologist wouldn't see me. It was unreal. Um, anyway, had brain surgery. Have a shunt, and now everything's fixed. But I have this weird thing in my head. Um, it's it's like the, I'm just trying to survive in this in these these last years being in St. Louis and just trying to move forward. So, but being in this space and being in this place was so helpful and so um, rejuvenating. 
in a weird way, connecting with a, with a space and a place that I didn't know about and as an adult. Um, I still am unpacking a lot of this. This show is about the unpacking of, of what this was. Uh, I'll go back there and do some more work, but I really enjoyed this space and it gave me a new uh, link to my history in a way that I didn't expect. Um, so with that, with that brain surgery and with this new brain, I have had this relationship with my brain now. Um, my, been, I, I'm sorry. Um, with my brain now, it, all of a sudden it became a lot about shapes and colors and putting things together and obsessively arranging color aid. There's this thing in high art school which is color aid. And they give it to you in these light color and design classes where you understand composition and how to work with different colors. But it's a pain in the butt, but it's also very beautiful because there are like 315 different pieces of gorgeous colored paper. And so I just, where that stuff, so bless you, bless you, started putting these papers together and arranging them. Bless you. I uh, started thinking about the nude rainbow and how the word nude is always associated with light skin, right? And trying to recreate that nude um, in all the different colors I use in portraiture, right? Um, this one is about, you know, what it what it's like to be a darker skinned person in the world. Nude is represented in band-aids and makeup and, you know, and, and I have no problem with the two as a lighter skinned person. But the, these women who have very, very dark skin, they are never given this opportunity, like like people with lighter skin, right? There's very few places, or it's better now, it's definitely better now. Um, but, but just investigating this word nude and the colors of portraiture and the color of skin tone, um, and just sort of investigating tediously these 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 pieces, because me cutting these pieces, placing these pieces, is much like what it's like dealing with race. It's tedious, it's time consuming, it's, it's crazy and it's up in the air and I think a lot of people who don't have to deal with it, you know, always wonder, well, why do we have to talk about race? You know, when you're a person of color, you don't get to not deal with it. It's not an option. So that's kind of what this, this image is about, but it, it's about also the brain, my new brain, being obsessed with uh, geometry and, and colors and shapes and wanting to control in that way. Um, so here's Caleb too, my assistant, helping me. I was working bigger again with paper and using these big rulers, but I couldn't steady myself. Mm. So Caleb would be my body and I would sort of tell him what to do. And he was amazing. We had so much fun together. We had such amazing discussions about race and, and religion and gender, everything. It was just great. And that's what this work is meant to do, is start a discussion. Um, it is about connecting people and learning to empathize and sort of see what the other has been through. Um, the football players became a big thing for me. And I hate football. I'm not a I'm not a football fan. I care less. But there was something about seeing these large, athletic, strong men lined up kneeling on the ground. That even if you don't agree with what they're doing, like can you see that there's hurt there? That they're hurting. And I think that that, that these players, these these people in entertainment. They, they don't often get to live their lives, you know, as, 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 as people who are not famous. Or, and again, the black the male body and wanting to comfort these, this situation. Again, I care less about football, but, but I think it's very poignant if that these, so many of these traditionally, like, uh, hard men are, are just in pain to really need somebody to stop and say something or to listen or to empathize. Um, black lines for me, again, the zebra, but also that boundaries. Um, 
stopping points, beginning and ending points, and the paper again cutting, but again now I'm cutting with these big pieces. I've, with these shapes and these men, Caleb helped me. Because again, my brain is very different now, and I have a hard time um, following directions like this to set up the computer to cut the paper. Mm -hmm. So Caleb helped me with this, and we did it together. But again, it's this idea of my hand versus the machine hand, and wanting to be my hand only, but having to use this machine, right? And being forced into this place, um, boundaries that, that my body has set up for me. Uh, this is this is again sort of similar, uh, but this negative. This is about empathy. Like if we could all put ourselves in the opposite, what happens if all of you know civil rights, all of race relations were reversed, and it was you know the white community that was for some reason sort of because these things are ideas, right? They like culture and the. the significance of, of black and white is something that we have put on things and um, a good good lesson in life I think is, is that how do you get into a space where you can see what the other person is dealing with um, that's that's sort of what this is similar in this one sort of just looking for whoops landscapes and and looking but using the marble paper to be um, the image with which I sort of carved the situation out of. Um, but these two figures, the same figure, looking at each other, um, trying to relate to each other, trying to... I'm still sort of thinking about this image. I don't know if you probably tell. I don't really fully understand it, but... Um, it's just, again, seeing that black male body in the struggle that's happening that has been happening, that has always been happening. Um, I forget the title of this. It's called uh, Unknown Landscape, Brain on Fire. And it really visually signifies what my brain is doing right now, which is needing order and looking to plant lines and make borders and concrete decisions about things, but then, you know, the sky is turmoil and fluid and, and organic and, you know, and fighting with trying to understand who I am now and this other identity that it, I couldn't even put in my writing. I've been trying to put this disabled word in my structure, in my writing, in my thinking, and I'm having a hard time doing it. You know, my, my brain is wanting all these different things. But, but it's about this next step, which is the identity of disability that I'm, okay. I'm trying to take on and incorporate that into the work as well. So um, that's, that's the, the end of it. And also sort of where I'm, I think that's, oh yeah, that's going into this world of non-representation, non-figure, um, non something that is more abstract and non-representational versus this concrete world. So, and I, th I attribute that and I connect that with the disability side of things. So I'm looking forward to sort of seeing where that goes. Um, and this stuff is really hard for me to talk about and I, I don't get an opportunity a lot to to speak with people like this. Um, so I apologize for flipping back and forth. It, it's still uh, something in progress and I, I really appreciate your time and your um, uh, energy. Um, but it's the discussion. I think that empathy is what we really need to lead with these days, all days, but especially in this time. Um, and as a biracial person, I think, much like Barack Obama, we have this need to sort of bring people together. Like, and I, I do attribute that. I don't, I'm trying to find out, but I think that's a biracial thing. It's a lot of people think, but I think that's <laughs> probably maybe uh, somewhat consistent with people who grow up trying to connect to new sides of things, right? Um,
So yeah, this is about abstraction, it's about the unknown, this is about reorganizing the boundaries, re-evaluating shapes, inserting, and uh, finding some sort of authority. That's the next step. So, I think that's the last one. Yeah? Thank, Thank you so much.